Buongiorno. Good morning and welcome. It's so, so nice to see so many new and old friends and familiar faces, scholars, artists, filmmakers, teachers, writers, and students. We're so happy to have you here in Florence, and we thank you for traveling from near and far to join us in this weekend of rich conversation and debate. It is my pleasure to introduce Ellen Toscano, the executive director of NYU Florence, and a lawyer by training who earned her LLM in international law from NYU Law School. She is the founder of La Pietra Dialogues and the producer of The Season, a summer festival in Florence that assembles artists, writers, musicians, and public intellectuals to produce new works or reinterpretations of classics. Prior to coming to Florence, Toscano was deeply involved and supportive of the arts in New York City, where she served as the counsel to the New York State Assembly, Committee on Education, and on the boards of several prominent arts and cultural institutions, including the Bronx Museum and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Without further ado, I bring you Ellen Toscano. Thank you. Buongiorno. That's great. Everybody speaks Italian now after one day. That's so wonderful. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to Florence. On behalf of all of my colleagues and friends from NYU Florence, both the staff and faculty that have joined us today, and before I go any further, thank you to all of the staff that have uh, made this effortless for, the, for those of us who have to participate. And welcome on behalf of New York University in general. It is a true honor for me personally and for all of us at NYU Florence to have the opportunity to work with Deb Willis and Oa Mamka in planning and hosting this extraordinary conference and exhibition with Bob Holmes who's here with us in the front row. Awam and I have been dreaming about this exhibition for many, 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 many years. Thanks to the generous support of Bob, the dream has come to fruition. There's nobody quite like Deb Willis. I've never seen a collaboration of scholars and artists convened over time and throughout the world to work together on a subject of imaging the black body. To, do, to join this tradition with the exhibition is truly a historic and historically exciting event. Finally, on a personal thanks side, very early on, this project earned the enthusiastic support and active participation of NYU's Vice Provost for Arts, Humanities, and Multicultural Affairs, Uli Baer, who's here someplace. In every critical moment of planning, Uli has provided much needed advice and support. Thank you, Uli. Oh, great. <laughs> we are in Florence at NYU Florence for this meeting because of the ownership by NYU of about 35 sculptures depicting Africans in different contexts uh, with various meanings, but commonly brought together under the decorative art category of blackamoors. They are part of the overall collection of about 6,000 objects in, Villa, in NYU's Villa La Pietra. <clears throat> in general, these objects are viewed as unimportant pieces of decorative art whose function is to provide frame for the more important works of art with which they're displayed. Though they're generally not read as depicting Africans as subject of history, blackamoors exist within a complicated history of exchange between Italy and Africa. The 15th century African slavery or servanthood that they represent, the period of colonization during which they were collected and displayed at Villa La Pietra, and finally the 20th century, 21st century Italy struggling with a new influx of Africans migrating to Italy. The context is never neutral. For our primarily American students, 
encountering the Blackamoors in Villa La Pietra is startling and uncomfortable. Arriving in Italy to study with their own preoccupations or preconceptions of Italian culture, fostered in large part by a robust tourist industry, students find their, uh, these objects out of place, mysterious and strangely silent. What are they? Why are they still displayed? What is the historic relationship of Italy and Africa, and how is the current migration reflective of that history? I've been very encouraged that our students have been moved by the tragic loss of life of migrants reaching the shores of Italy, of Europe through Italy. This past academic year in a series entitled Black Italia, a title given to us by Alessandro De Maio, who will present, uh, I think, in the next panel. Students explored the causes of migration, the policy debate in Italy and the EU about this migration, and the unimaginable tragedy of lives lost at sea. One student, Claudia Saracida, a junior in Global Liberal Studies, organized a conference this spring inviting UN and humanitarian organizations to campus to discuss Italy's Mare Nostrum policy and the EU's rather less humane policy aimed at pushing migrants back to North Africa. Claudia is one of the many students participating and assisting in this conference, and I thank her and all of the rest of the students who are here. This is the great educational advantage for students studying abroad, the opportunity to confront and learn from different cultures, even those thought to be similar or familiar to our American students. They learn deeply about Italy, but also reflect back critically on the society from which they travel. What is the record of American migration policy? How does US policy compare to Italian? How do the different historical and cultural contexts influence migration policy? These objects, the Blackamoors, one of which is depicted in a photograph by Deb Willis, have never been as important as they are now today as the instigators of this important conference, the inspiration for a remarkable exhibition, and the point of departure for a student inquiry. So thank you, Blackmores. <laughs> and now I have the great pleasure of welcoming to the conference Shalane McRae, First Lady of New York City and Chair of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, which is charged with creating public-private partnerships in support of Mayor Bill de Blasio's progressive agenda. Ms. McRae is a writer a poet and a lifelong advocate for the arts who believes that the enjoyment and expression of creativity is integral to leading a full, healthy, and productive life. She brings an important perspective to open our discussions today. As First Lady, she is a fierce advocate for high quality and accessible mental health services. She's currently leading a multi-agency effort to create a mental health system that bridges the gaps and disparities that currently prevent too many New Yorkers from getting the help that they need. She has also lent her voice and platform to the de Blasio administration's efforts to expand early childhood programs, support the survivors of domestic violence, and expand access to the arts in all New York's, to all New York City residents, both US and foreign born, through the new Muni ID program. She has partnered with organizations such as Alvin Ailey uh, and Urban Word NYC to help young children uh, learn how to use art to transform their communities and promote mental wellness, wellness and provide positive body image. As chair of the Mayor's Fund, she's proud to support Neon Arts, a neighborhood-based initiative that immerses young adults on probation in transformative educational and cultural experiences. Ms. McRae also partnered with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs to build case studies on diversity in arts and develop opportunities for greater inclusion. Ms. McRae graduated from Wesley College and completed the Radcliffe, Radcliffe Publishing Course. Her first position in government was in the press office of the New York City Commission for Human Rights. It was while working for Mayor David Dinkins that she met Bill de Blasio, whom she married in 1994. They have two wonderful children, named Chiara and Dante. Hmm, how appropriate. 
<laughs> but the First Lady's participation in our conference is not solely about highlighting the important scholarship and rich artistic achievement of our New York City participants, or not only about forging a connection between New York City and Florence. Her presence demonstrates that our conference is truly a global conversation involving scholars and artists from numerous universities across the world about the important social, cultural, and political questions posed by imaging the black body in art that are worldwide in their implications and impa impact. I am especially pleased to welcome Ms. McRae, who I have the privilege of calling my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Buongiorno. <laughs> I've got my one word. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here. And I, I'm, I got in yesterday, and I had a chance to go to the villa, and it was just fabulous. I felt like I was being fed, you know? Really, all those, all oh, so many people, and the beauty of the night, it was just wonderful. And the, I want you to know the villa brings together three of our family favorites, Italy, NYU, and thought-provoking art. Those three would be enough, but wait, there's more. La Pietra is led by the ever-charming Ellen Toscano, <laughs> whose warmth and wit are di fama mondiale, which is legendary. <laughs> Bill and I are so pleased to count her as a very dear friend, and I'm also grateful for like, anyone who had a, a part and putting together this conference. It's such an intriguing, intriguing and fascinating assemblage. And Ellen, you know I love you, but when I saw the list of people who are going to come to this conference, that's when I made the decision. <laughs> I had to be here. And I am especially grateful to whoever carved out a few moments for me to share a few words with you this morning because the theme of this conference lines up perfectly with a topic I've been thinking about since I was a little girl the intersection of blackness and beauty. Given that I was born in 1954, it should come as no surprise that one of my first images of what a pretty little girl was supposed to look like was Shirley Temple, America's biggest little star. Watching her on TV was like looking at a mirror that magically showed my exact opposite. The things that seemed most cute about Shirley Temple, her nose, her lips, and of course her hair, were the things I grew to dislike about myself. As a young teenager, the images that dominated my whole world changed, but their hair and skin color did not. Everywhere I looked, I was bombarded with all kinds of, of, of images, glossy pictures, which were so compelling and so not about me. I studied women's magazines for tips on how to make myself look like these images I was so surrounded with. And tried to get attractive, desirable, maybe even gorgeous. Of course, nothing was going to make me look less black. And I still remember one particularly humiliating experience. When I was still in high school, and for a hot second there, wigs were very popular. Everyone was wearing them. Even some of the girls at my all-white high school were wearing them. And I decided to give it a try and I got this wig with black curls. They were not Shirley Temple curls, but they were big and bouncy and shiny, and I thought I looked pretty damn good. I held my head up high, and I shook my curls. I shook my curls, and I shook my curls. <laughs> right up until the moment I heard one so-called friend whisper to another so-called friend that Shirlane looks kind of like a prostitute, don't you think? I was so devastated, quietly, of course. I put so much effort into getting the look that would give me the look. So I'd be admired and desired, and here I was being snickered at. Well, thankfully, the world was changing, and I was too. We made great strides with Black is Beautiful, and 
than Toni Morrison, Miriam Makiba, Nikki Giovanni, Cicely Tyson, Angela Davis, Maya Angelou, and so many others, helped us to understand not just the level of damage, the depth of the damage to our black psyche, but our intellect and our beauty and how much we had to give to the world. But that work is still far from over. Just pick up a women's magazine or flip through the TV channels. Check out the newspapers and look at the photos. Look at the images in our world of black men, black women, black children, or the lack of them. A picture is still worth a thousand words. And that is one big reason why this conference is so important. As artists and art lovers, we have the ability and the power to create new images of blackness and redefine old ones. We have the power to reshape the institutions that control the images. I want you to know that earlier this year, the de Blasio administration launched a major initiative to promote diversity in the staffs, boards, and audiences of the city's cultural organizations, including museums, dance troupes, and orchestras. This work is long overdue. Nationwide, more than 90% of museum staff are white. At the, time, at the same time, African Americans and Latinos, people of color, are much less likely to visit museums than their white counterparts. In a city where nearly two-thirds of residents identify as non-white, this is a major problem. I saw this troubling reality for myself last week when I visited the Jacob Lawrence exhibit at MoMA. The exhibit itself is, a remark is remarkable. It's just, I, I left there just feeling so emotionally moved on, on every level. And it's a wonderful, inspiring chronicle of the Great Migration, but again, the journey our ancestors began a century ago is far from over. Because when I looked around the galleries, most of the black people I saw were on the walls or standing guard. And I don't mean to single out MoMA, which is amazing, and which put together an audience-expanding ex exhibition of a seminal artist. But the truth of the matter is that many of our most treasured institutions face a similar challenge. And that's the bad news. The good news is that the presidents and the board chairs we've been meeting with have shown a refreshing eagerness to tackle the challenge head on. These meetings are part of a demographic study we're undertaking to gain a better understanding of the full problem. The study will engage all of the nearly 1,000 cultural nonprofits that receive New York City funding. And we're asking stakeholders what's working? How can we build on those best practices to create lasting, long-term change. But the burden doesn't fall only on our cultural institutions. If we want a future where children of all colors feel good about what they see in the mirror, then we all have to do our share. That means speaking up, making waves, not compromising, and never, ever allowing yourself to be the only person of color in a place of power. Because what's the point of having influence if you don't use it for good, right? <laughs> now, I am so eager to hear what all of you have to say, and I'm going to be very busy appreciating all of the black beauty and positive images at this conference. But please, don't be shy if you see me around. I'm going to be here all weekend, and, and just thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm, I'm just loving this already. Thank you. I know it was a long evening. But <laughs> Good morning. My name is Awam Amka, and um, it's a great pride and honor that I am here talk, to talk to you about what I expect you to engage with this evening in the opening of the first um, venue of the exhibition, Resignifications. Um, but before I do that, I just want to extend uh, my gratitude, uh, as everyone else has, uh, to uh, various colleagues and staff and uh, the university for giving us the ability and the resources to um, launch this initiative and to continue to do what we do, but also to thank 
uh, supporters, great supporters like Robert Holmes, who, without whom this project wouldn't have actually uh, uh, kicked off because of his support. So thank you, Bob. <laughs> and there are so many people we encounter in our work in the university, but I think consistently uh, we have colleagues like Uli Bayer, uh, 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 who actually has given us so much. Um, he's also part of the team, so he's not only a, a supporter, but he's part of uh, the group of scholars and artists who have engaged this subject over time. Uh, but, of course, with Ellen Toscano and her friendship, we started talking about this, as she said, a while ago. It's almost a decade now. And um, we were always wondering what to do with these black amours. Uh, and um, we thought we should just do something unusual. And in doing that thing unusual, we needed all kinds of support with similar uh, uh, pe people with similar impulses, and so we were lucky to bring together people with the same kind of impulses, and of course, um, Deb Willis, <laughs> uh, who's <is> not only, <laughs> uh, who's not only uh, a colleague, a collaborator, and a dear friend, but uh, a confidant, was actually always there to say, let's do it, let's, do, let's stop talking about it, let's just make it happen. And so it's a gratitude to her for making this happen. Now, one of the things we were concerned about was in the history of representations of people of African descent, the question of our, the objectifications of our bodies, the objectifications of our subjecthood was always at heart uh, in what we do and even the languages with which we oppose or express our opposition to these representations are always mediated. So we wanted to do something that would challenge the way typical institutions with long history of art and representation, such as in cities like Florence, wanted to challenge how they classify and place people like us. And so um, this project, well, we started out by having a conversation, artists and scholars, and then decided to bring some artists in residence to respond to the Blackamores at NYU's Villa La Pietra. And it was the response from that that also informed our selection of artists all over the world who are working on uh, using um, people of African descent as subjects of art rather, as, rather than as objects of art. Um, so we looked across artists from Africa, from Europe, from North and South America and the Caribbean to really find a truly global conversation that is interconnected and that's also responding to um, the, 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 not only the content but also the diverse strategies of artistic representations. It will be a great shout out to call all the names, but there's no time to do that. So I expect you will come to the exhibitions tonight and tomorrow in the openings to see the diverse kinds of artists as well as styles that are engaging with the subject of re-signifying the modes of representing Africans in symbolic representations. At a time when Africans actually, um, thousands are dying in the Mediterranean, at a time where um, people of African descent are increasingly, in the 21st century, more homeless than at home in terms of uh, being asked to leave or being actually told they were not legitimate occupants of the spaces they live in. At this time, we begin to think that the art we produce and the critical knowledge we engage with actually have a political and historical ramification. So what we're saying is not in the abstract. As we speak right now, there are hundreds of people either on boats trying to cross the Mediterranean or about to, and there are others who actually did not make it, perhaps in the last hour. And so we are in a context where also in the United States where it was increasingly getting more dangerous to be a black person on the streets. Um, uh, uh, not talk of the Caribbean islands where the social conditions are increasingly intensifying uh, the sense of oppression and, and so on and the weight of history. So for those of us who study, who teach, and who actually engage with this in our practices, we've come to a headway where we really feel we're in a state of emergency in our thinking and in the kinds of stuff we produce. 
So the works you'll be seeing, some of them are audacious, some of them are deeply, uh, persistently recalcitrant, some of them are totally um, deviant of all conventions uh, or the classical conventions of representations. And some of them just by their subject and their choices are really truly engaging uh, and provoke audiences. And in, in uh, Museo Bardini where we are at today, we are actually exhibiting in an existing collection and this guy was himself an iconoclastic collector. He didn't want to collect things according to genres and histories and so on. So it's almost like a clutter of different kinds of stuff but put into conversation with each other. And so our work actually is intersected by these collection in Museo Mardini, and I'm hoping that you'll enjoy and engage and talk about it. A lot of the artists are here, so you can talk to them directly about what they do and how they got to produce what they produced. And tomorrow at uh, um, Galleria Biagioti, you'll also see mostly photographic responses to the same subject matter and a few sculptures there as well. So I'm hoping this will be a fantastic get together and I would like to once again thank our colleagues and our students and staff who have actually made this possible and looking forward to the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Awam. Thank all of you for being here. I'm Deb Willis, and I'm really excited. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Really excited to share this moment uh, with my colleagues um, and also my, my partner here, Cheryl Finley, who's been with us since the beginning of these conferences. Um, we have... Um, work together. Um, I met Cheryl. It's in terms of Claudia's acknowledgement from um, the experience of Ellen, I met Cheryl when she graduated from um, Wellesley. And she was at a talk at the Studio Museum. And I was speaking about James Van Der Zee. And she decided she wanted to know me. And at that moment, we connected. And so we've connected ever since. And I'd like to share that moment because I believe in mentoring. And I think it's really important. And I'd like for all of the NYU Florence staff and Tisch staff, as well as CAS, please stand up and get a round of applause. A number of people um, have acknowledged the work of, of our staffs. And it's really encouraging to see that we're all in the same Conversation. conversation. Um, I also would like to acknowledge special people who supported this um, conference, as well as the other names that were mentioned by Ellen and Awam, but to have an artist like Carrie Mae Weems, who decided <laughs> that it was important because we, could, we didn't get big funding from a number of organizations that we applied. We were always denied why. They said, you've, you've had six already. What else is it to say? Can you imagine receiving some kind of notice like that? And so we, um, we, you know, we reached out. And we didn't give up. And so we received money from NYU and people like Carrie Mae Weems, Ford Foundation, um, to invite artists from Africa and the Caribbean, and then also studio museum support, but also with the State Department Art and Embassies Program. The Harvard University Hutchins um, Center, um, Skip, has, Skip has been a partner from the beginning. And it's really important to have that involvement. And with Mancha Diawara, who has been an advocate for as long as I could remember, in this conversation. So we'd like to just acknowledge and please applaud all of the supporters. But it's also a special moment for all of us to just kind of think about the past. And then Cheryl's going to kind of list the other conferences and then we're going to begin the day. Great. Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you all. One of the things to consider, I think Awam, we also want to thank you once again for really bringing into focus and highlighting the critical nature 
of what is at stake. Um, what is at stake for us here in the conversations that we'll be having over the weekend? What is at stake in the world? Why are we here in Florence and, and not in New York or not in Cambridge or not somewhere else in the world? And I think, Awam, you really brought that into focus for us. Um, one of the things to point out about these conferences is that they began a while ago. They began um, a little bit over a decade ago in 2004. Uh, Skip Gates had the wonderful idea of bringing together a number of artists, uh, artists who were established but also emerging artists, scholars, scholars who were uh, just finishing their degrees or just even beginning to think about art um, and African American art. And he began what we thought was going to be the first annual uh, conference on African American art. It was called Bridging the Gaps and it took place at Harvard in 2004. Um, and at that time, we had a really, really rich, engaging dialogue. It was cross and intergenerational, cross and interdisciplinary, and it was something that fostered these conferences going on, uh, symposia going on, as we said, in, in six different editions. In 2007 in New York, here and now, it was staged, Deb Willis staged that conference, African American Art and Film, it was at NYU. At 2000, in 2009 at MICA in Maryland, Leslie Kin Hammond decided to think about how we can bring the idea of pedagogy into the dialogue and she put together a conference called Think Tank 2010 and Beyond New Directions in African American Art and that was specifically about thinking about how we can teach people about teaching art, how we teach the teachers, how we are teachers ourselves, how we're students, many of us, we're all students here in this room. In 2011, we had Beauty and Fashion Black Portrait Symposium at NYU. And in 2013, many of you will remember, we were all in Paris for the first edition of Black Portraitures, The Black Body in the West. And now we're here in Florence with the second edition of Black Portraitures. And I think in each different edition, we're bringing in examples of different works of art, different themes, of course, that are pertinent for our times. We're also engaging in not just new media, but new forms of media. And I think even thinking about the sculptures um, and the works of decorative art at La Pietra, we're also considering how we can bring even historical examples of art into this new conversation, a new conversation with artists, as you've done with the exhibition beautifully, Awam. So we'd like to end and begin um, the day, thank all of you, specifically the speaker and pa speakers and panelists who've traveled here um, and to share these moments. But the first lady said um, something about beauty and, and, and that's something that's a central part of my work. It's in search of beauty and, and to talk about it. And there are a number of speakers here who are going to unpack the notion of what it means but also to unpack the experiences that we've all had because people did not understand about our beauty. So that's uh, at a central point. But I also like to end with um, three names. And, and there's Jean-Paul Collin, who is here, who, please stand up for a second. He um, co-sponsored the Paris, the Paris um, conference. It's really essential. Um, Dean Allison Green, also was a supporter of, of this conference, and I'm not sure if she's here yet. And then also Dean Mary Schmidt Campbell, former dean and president-elect of Spelman College. She supported the other three conferences that we organized. And so thank you all, and we'd like for the first panel to um, join the stage. Thank you. Thank you.